Welcome, Anchor Point. So glad you could join us if you're watching here on video. Uh, we're going to jump in pretty quickly here. Not too much for announcements. You can check out the newsletter if you want to know more. You can sign up for that on the website. Uh, you can also always send us an email if you want to get in touch. And a note on the Bibles from last week for Kenya. We raised, yes. I think you said, almost to the penny the amount we needed to send them. Was it 35 Bibles? It was, yeah, 35 Bibles. We were guessing 350 bucks. Um, we don't have the exchange rate yet, so yeah. a little over, a little under, but right, I mean, just bang on. And that's awesome. That's just such a cool opportunity. I'm glad we could do that. So we want to uh, start off today with a little uh, a, a video. This is Sanctity of Life Sunday. It's also uh, MLK weekend, and it's kind of cool to me how they correspond on the same at the same time every year, even though they were very different events that started um, uh, both of these uh, specific days, and the, uh, because both of them are about life, and both of them are about saving lives, and and so sanctity of life. Of course, we work closely with CareNet across the property, and and I was going to interview Peggy today, and Jen is the new associate director working with her. We really, really want to have her here, but she contracted COVID last week, and so everything's on hold for a little while. But we are still going to uh, play the video to let you know a little bit about uh, CareNet that we work with so closely. We are all born to a mighty king who loves us as his own children. He sees us as precious and calls us crowns of beauty in his hands. Every one of us is graced with a purpose in his kingdom. However, we sometimes lose sight of that, especially when we find ourselves in difficult, unplanned situations. When a pregnancy is unexpected, the parents might forget their own worth and to have difficulty seeing the baby growing in the womb as royalty. We want to show these mothers and fathers how much he loves them and the new life beginning inside. We want to wrap them in his hope, his peace, and his majesty. Our clients are able to catch a glimpse of the little prince or princess through our ultrasound ministry. They see a child of the king who already bears his image and already has a purpose. We offer educational and support programs that equip new moms and dads to successfully raise royalty. Our post-abortion ministry offers hope and love for those broken from past decisions. They can cast off robes of pain and wear their crowns as rightful heirs. This is where you come in. You can help others see themselves as God sees them. What part can you play in this kingdom? Whatever gifts God has given you, we can use them for His glory to further His kingdom. So one more thing about uh, Karen, not that the uh, video is over. If you stop by the office or if you're able to come here uh, over the weekend or during the week we're here, we have the baby bottles for CareNet that you can put your change in. And if you're not able to come here, you can certainly give directly. I believe we have those links uh, in our newsletter. So we're going through the book of Philippians. We're in, uh, in chapter 2, verses uh, starting in verse 19, and then we're going to go through the end of the chapter in the first verse of chapter 3. And I called it the gambling pastor just because it sounded, I was going to call it the gambling priest. And I thought, ah, they might gamble. So I'll call it the gambling <laughs> pastor. So I wanted to ask you, John, if you, if that's, if, was it ever anything that hooked you or you got into or anything gambling? You know, no, it, it wasn't. And it's, it's kind of a funny story. This one time, the, one of my friends who I worked in Christian radio with, for whatever reason, had gone to Las Vegas for a trip. And, you know, neither of us smoke, drink, gamble, nothing. So I, I'm not really sure why they went, but they went. And they invited me along as a kind of a surprise, so I went. And I kind of determined when I was there, okay, fine. I'm here, I'll do like a penny slot. And come, you know, as a result of my ignorance, I didn't realize you couldn't just put a penny in there. And so I never ended up doing it. It was too complicated, and I figured, well, ah, whatever. You had to go to the money changers, right? The something, yeah, yeah, some sort of process. But I was like, ah, forget we, it. So we're going we're gonna to find gambling just a little bit different. Uh, today, but it, it does a, it is a word that comes right out of the text. Uh, but when I was in high school, my mom, I, I remember, would give me 50 cents for lunch. And I mean, this was a long time ago, but it wasn't that long ago. And you would buy uh, food out of these machines. They'd make sandwiches and put in ding-dongs was my favorite and stuff. But 
Fidget spins wouldn't, you know, just wouldn't get you anything. So we would play nickel a hand, five card draw, poker. And I would play it. I figured if I lost my 50 cents, big deal. I really couldn't get much anyway. If I got anywhere close to a dollar, like, you know, 75 cents, a buck five something, then I'd blow it anyway on lunch. So that's my gambling uh, history. And, but we want to talk today a, bit, a little bit about what it's like to follow Christ. We leaned into that some. We called it working out our salvation. And is it a gamble to follow Christ? And I know the, you know, the, the quick answer is no, it's never a gamble because God, you know, we're in the hands of God. Um, but can't it feel like a gamble? Do you really know where you're going? Uh, is it weird to follow Christ? Are you going to lose your friends if you follow Christ? Is, is, that real, is this really something I want to do? And so uh, Paul's going to give us a couple of examples of, of what it means to really work at observation and, 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 and follow him. But to set it up, we want to start where we ended last week, kind of where we started and ended, because as we go through Philippians, again, it, it, the text kind of grows. And so as it builds, we want to make sure we have that foundation under us. So I'm going to have John kind of take us through the chart while I do my messy writing on it, because it, it really charted out nicely. We stole the idea from, from John Piper. <laughs> so thanks, John. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So in the first one here, we have the promise. And we have things like uh, you're going to shine, you'll be blameless, pure, make God proud, and be full of joy. <clears throat> and Dan and I were talking, and it kind of seemed like the way uh, this was presented in Greek to a Western mind kind of was backwards a little bit. Well, Piper did it backwards this way, if you, if you can call it backwards. And it really helped kind of get through it and, and, and help me struggle with it a bit to, to understand it better. So all of these things are the promises. Therefore, work out your salvation. And Dan had said last week, stop whining, start shining. For God's desire and power are already inside you. And that's the one where I kind of, yeah, so the last one there, God's desire and power are already inside you. And that's the one I kind of got stuck on last week. <clears throat> and after a while, I tried reading it backwards the other way and thought, well, maybe this will make a little bit more sense. And it totally did. God's desire and God's power are already inside you. So work out your salvation. You're empowered to work out your salvation and stop whining. And the promises are, You'll shine, be pure, make God proud, and be full of joy. And so it's a cool, cool thing you can take both ways, and I found it really helpful either way. Yeah, I did it. it yeah, yeah, it, it is. It's super helpful. And so when we're talking about um, the gamble that it is to follow Christ, what it's like to follow Christ, I, it, it kind of comes back to his, his enabling us. His desire and his power are within us, and so we kind of have to do. If, we're, if he's going to live in us, we kind of have to do. But it ought to at least feel like a little a bit of a gamble because you're letting go, mm. right? You're just going. There's a promise over here, but you can't always see it on yeah. this side of the grave or on this side of the <laughs> issue or this side of the problem you're going through. So we're talking then really about working out your salvation. As I read through the text, it seemed to me when he got here, he starts talking. He's kind of taking care of business, talking about Timothy and, and this guy Epaphroditus. But while he's taking care of business, he gives us an illustration about what this looks like because these two guys are doing it, right? They're on it. So uh, just to give you a little background from when we started the book back before Christmas, uh, Timothy is from Lystra, and so he got saved on Paul's first missionary journey. Uh, Paul came through around there. He led this young man to Christ, probably you know, 13, 14 years old uh, kid, uh, but uh, um, he had a, a, a Jewish mom, a Gentile dad, and uh, now he hears uh, the way of salvation. And then so Paul finishes that journey. He comes back again on his uh, second trip, kind of missionary trip going through, and he wants to encourage the church in town. Paul's in a Philippi. Now, now the, the guy is 17 years old. And, uh, you know, Paul's sharing what he's going to do. And, and, and uh, so he's back in Lystra. We're going to go on somewhere else. And Timothy evidently tells him, hey, I'd like to go with you. And so... You know, here we're thinking, gosh, 17-year-old kid, and, the, and he's going to go out. He's going to go out with like Paul and Silas and Luke and and, and do this stuff. That's a, this is more than a one-week trip to Haiti, right? This is a pretty major uh, missionary trip. I'm thinking, I'm I'm the youngest of five kids, and my parents would have said, yeah, yeah, take them. You know, I'd have been the oldest. It would have been a little deader. So I'm I'm guessing he's the youngest of at least five, right? And uh, so he goes, and that's when the when the town Philippi. Um, when they put the church there, 
and the girl gets saved and the, and the wealthy lady uh, helps put the church in her home and all that stuff goes. Paul and Silas go in jail and the jailer comes to Christ. So Timothy's seen all this. Now it's 10 years later. So we go down the road 10 years. The church is now a 10-year-old church. Uh, Timothy's now a 27-year-old young man. And uh, um, he happens to be in Rome encouraging Paul. And so Paul is riding the church in Philippi. Timothy's with him, but Timothy was one who helped him start the church when he was only 17, and now he's 27. And here's what Paul says about Timothy. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare, for everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself, because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. And I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. Interesting. Um, everyone looks up for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. Earlier in, in the book, he says, I'll look up for the interests of others. So he kind of changes that. We'll lean into that in a little bit. But when he says everyone looks up for their own interests, if you go to Blue Letter Bible or one of the um, Greek Bible study tools that has an interlinear in it, you click on that word interest, it, it's not in there. And so he's just saying, hey, everybody has their own something. And the translators had to put something in there, but otherwise the sentence doesn't make any sense. And interest is probably the best word you could use. But yeah, so I, so I want, so John, if you, if you read that, everybody has their own, what, what would you think of? What would be going through your head? Yeah, I kind of thought of maybe time or um, economic interests is a big one. You know, everybody has their own thing they're working for in life, which is usually jobs or, or could be maybe more time with the family and that kind of thing. That's usually the motive at any rate. That's, that's what I came up with. Yeah. And so it's everyone, I think part of what he's saying is everyone's putting themselves as number one. But I'm saying you need to be second. You know, God needs to be number one. Timothy's someone, hey, he, he put God first. And he says, you know, because Timothy looks for the interest of Christ. And you were surprised it wasn't the others. Yeah. Yeah. Like <laughs> earlier in the book. Well, am I yeah. supposed to put the goals and interests of others first? Or am I supposed to put the goals and interests of Christ first? Now, where in the world do I fall in line? Because mm -hmm. I'm getting way down here at the <laughs> bottom of the list. And uh, I thought it was like, you know, we should put the goals and interests of our Jeep first. And, and uh, but I, when, when you look at putting the goals and interests of Christ first, I think that is the same as putting the goals and interests of others first. Like Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. That was his goal, was others. He loves the world. He loves you so much he came and died for you. And so he wants us to put others before ourselves. So putting others before ourselves is looking at his interests. Luke eleven twenty three. Jesus says, whoever doesn't gather sheep with me scatters. So there's, there's no neutral. We're looking out for ourselves only, or we're taking care of ourselves, but we're, we're putting the interests of Christ first. We're really caring about others. That's the thing. And so that's a, that's a bit of a gamble. That's scary. That's a, what he's calling us to do is huge. We forget. Well, I shouldn't say we forget this. We like this. God loves you. John, God loves you, period. You know, no matter what you've done, no matter what a knucklehead you've been, no matter where you are, God loves you. I was praying with someone uh, earlier today uh, that um, they were going to bring in hospice. They decided not to, but, uh, you know, they're, they're going through that a, a difficult time, right, with that. And so we love hearing and being able to say, no matter what you've done, God loves you. God cares for you. Turn your life over to give him. Get the thief on the cross, right? It's hours before he died, he gives his life to Jesus. He's with him in paradise. God loves you. No questions asked. The question is, do we love others with any bit of that kind of love? Do we have any of his kind of interest for others? It's great to say God loves you. It's a whole different thing to say that I love you. I care for you. And so I want to lean into a little bit of, a, a bit here about this whole missionary thing because he um, Timothy becomes a missionary at, at, at 17, and that just changes the direction of his life. Nothing's ever the, ever the same again. And so we've got some slides to show you. 
The first one is from a couple years ago when uh, Sue and Jen uh, went out to, it was our last missions trip to Haiti. We went out there, and again, we're only there for, you know, a week or two. We're not there for a long time. But it's just, it's so life-changing to be in that different culture, and you just, you go there to put others first, so you put others first. And then you come back, and then our culture seems so weird. It's, 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 a, it's a change of gears. And I know it's not for everyone to, to go to Haiti the, the, for on, in our next trip, but the question is, what opportunity is God giving you to put others first? Work out your salvation that way. You know, Matthew 28 uh, you know, says, you know, go into all the world and make disciples, and, and we use that in missions conferences all the time. Uh, the Greek, it is an imperative in the Greek, but it's probably better translated in the presence as you're going to make disciples. So I've given you a life. I've given you desires. I've given you power. So as you're going out through your life, make, make some disciples. And so here Timothy is. He's at home in Lystra. Paul comes back to you, and he says, hey, I've got a desire. I'd like to go with you. Now, his mom didn't go. His dad didn't go. But God had put in him that specific desire. So what I'd like to lean into a little bit today is what, what specific desire has God given you? And gosh, for those of you like Timothy who are single, if you're young, if you're retired, if you've got that ability to do something, be where God's pulling you. God, go for those passions. Like Camp Penile made the big difference for me when I was 18 years old. That changed, definitely changed the trajectory of my life. Um, we have uh, a gal here, Darla, who started a thing called uh, Friends Feeding Friends, and once a month she and others go out to uh, the Rock at Noonday and they feed the homeless. And if that's a passion of yours, you can jump, you know, let me know. I'll help you jump on board with that. Ellis has always taken a trip to Mexico. I, I CareNet next door, you know, just cares about these young families who need support to come alongside them, not just to save the, the lives of the unborn infants, but to save the family, to love families and see them come and, and uh, be part of the kingdom. We have a, a youth group here that's, gosh, been meeting throughout uh, COVID. They've been doing Zoom meetings on Wednesdays, and then they meet here on Sunday afternoon. And we really do need more leaders for that. We don't want the wrong leaders. We don't want just people that feel guilty, but people that have the passion that Timothy had that says, man, I, yeah, I'd like to give that, give that a whirl and, and see if that passion is inside me. And the result of it, of doing all this, God's given you the desire. You say, yeah, you know, I'm going to check that out. And some things I've tried. It's like, ah, no, this isn't for me. But when you realize, ah, oh, this is kind of working, you, you, you start to shine and you say, this is what I want to do. And there's a joy, even when it's really hard and it's difficult, you know, with the mosquitoes. And the, one time the heat index hit 147 in Port-au-Prince. Anyway, on those kind of days, there's still a joy in the middle of the major sweat. Um, and so we got a couple pictures of, of uh, joy there. I got one with, uh, with Micah, uh, my son Micah in Haiti, and another one with Amanda when we were back when you could ride in the back of the pickup um, safely, uh, you know, before the rights and things were around. She was riding in the back years ago. And anyway, he says in 219, I'm going to be cheered. In 228, 29, you'll be glad. We'll do this with great joy. It's just this cool kind of thing happens when we see this happen in our lives. And it happened in Timothy's life. This last week, uh, I think I got a little glimpse of that. So the last Haiti slide here is Cole de Gregorian. And it, it's he and my son Caleb working on the my favorite vehicle on the planet, the 98 Trooper there. Uh, what a piece of junk. It, it was old diesel. Uh, but it's, it is a joy to see it resurrect when we go back there. Anyway, they're working on the Trooper. And this was so long ago. I mean, I remember asking one of them, can you go, can you go get me a hacksaw? And they said, what's a hacksaw? I mean, they were young. You know, they had never done this kind of stuff before. Well, now they're both active in ministry. And I got an email from Cole this week, and he just said, Dan, I'm just checking on you. I know, you know, COVID's been hard and, and churches and people in, in, in leadership, and so I was wondering, how can I pray for you? How's your family doing? How's Anchor Point? How's the church? How are you holding up to all this? Wow. Here's this kid you see in the slide at, you know, whatever age they were, you know, 14 or something, and 
now here he is these years later pastoring his pastor. It's just such a a cool thing. So there's this couple things this looks like, and the two main things I'd like you to remember that it work at your salvation look like. One is pastoring. You become a pastor in your home group, in your family, in whatever it is. Caring for people is just pastoring people. You minister people. But the other thing it is, is it's a gamble. Uh, it's unpredictable. Verse 23 says, you know, I hope to send Timothy to you. I don't know how this is going to go. I'm hoping to do that. Uh, he's, you know, he says, we're going to see how things go with me. Uh, he's in Rome, Paul is, on trial for his, uh, you know, his faith, for what he's teaching and, you know, saying that this new sect's going to be the end of Rome or whatever. And, and he doesn't know if he's going to, if he's going to be beheaded or if he's going to, if he's going to be released. He doesn't know yet because the legal case isn't over yet. He says, when he says later, I'm confident in the Lord, when you read that, uh, you can translate that if it's the Lord's will. You know, I, 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 I'm confident whatever he does is the right thing. You know, whether, whether I'm beheaded or whether I get to come see you back in Philippi, I, I'm, I'm good either way. It's not a gamble in that if we know God, we've always had him. If Jesus is your Savior, you're never separated from him. And so when you go uh, you know, through death, I mean, Jesus is always with you. There's, there's no change. There's no gamble there. But I just wanted to say, don't follow Jesus for a predictable life. Follow an unpredictable Jesus for Jesus. We don't follow him because he's... We don't follow him because he's going to make our life the way we want our life to be. We follow him because the life he has for us is the life we need to be. He's the one in charge. It, and the result, I mean, the result of following him is we will shine. We will be blameless even before people around us. We will have joy. But it doesn't mean it's, it's a predictable life. It's not a normal life. It's a grace-filled life. Uh, John, when we were visiting through this, he had a, a phrase, I, I hope you'll write this down at home, I just, I want to, I don't have a slide for it, I want to take it with me, because, you know, it says, uh, everyone look else except for their own interests, not for those interests of Christ, John said, the interests of Christ are not the American dream, but that's it, the interests of Christ is other people, it's not the American dream, so that's Timothy, and then we got another guy to go through, and uh, his name is Epaphroditus, and it's funny, we'll steal Bible names, but there's some Bible names. They're just not going anywhere. Uh, this is one of them. And uh, he, he's the one that I, I really thought of as the gambling priest when I um, went through here. So I'm going to bring you back. I want to say it's like 18 months ago. I can't remember exactly. We like flew through the book of Acts. And when we were in Acts 28, there, that's a story about a shipwreck. And so... Um, the first missionary trip was over. Uh, Paul's come back. He's coming to Jerusalem. He's gotten arrested. Go, go, go through all of that, his arrest and everything. And now he's on his way to Rome to stand trial. And on the way to Rome, they're on this ship, and this huge storm comes up, and the ship's, you know, rocking. And it looks like they're all going to die. They empty the ship out because somehow, I don't understand it, but somehow if the ship's lighter, they're more likely to live because it's, not as deep in the water unless waves come in. I don't know. They're, they throw everything overboard. They put ropes around the ship, and they finally make it and, and, and uh, crash off the island of Malta. And later, they make it to Rome. And so that's how God brings Paul to Rome to be a witness there. Not an easy life, but a great life. Uh, when he's in Rome, he it gets an apartment, and he's under house arrest. So I have a, a slide here of what his, it would, could actually be his very apartment. When they were doing a demo in Rome years ago, they saved some of these apartments from the first and second century. And as they were going through them, they realized that the bottom floor was, was almost always uh, some kind of uh, shop. The next floor up was a manager's place. And then floors three and above is where they would house people in these little apartments, often that were going to, had something to do with what was going on in the judicial system, like Paul, who's under house arrest. He would have been chained to a Praetorian guard, which is the elite guard that would guard the, the, the senators and the emperor. 
the, the thing, though, about their prison system is in order to keep costs down, uh, they didn't have prisons. Well, they did have dungeons that he'll bring in next time, but not prisons like we know of. They had these apartments, and you had to pay rent for your apartment. You had to provide your own food. He's under house arrest, so he can have visitors and things. He's chained to this guard, but there's a bit of, of freedom here. But he has to provide for everything. Well, all his clothes got washed overboard in the shipwreck. And all of his stuff that, that, that he had, all of his money, all his everything is lost. Now he's got to pay rent for his apartment. And so somehow they got word to Philippi. They you know, wrote a letter or whatever. The Dr. Luke is with them. They get a letter out to Philippi. And Philippi says, oh, well, you know, let, let's help out. So just like we did with the Bibles, they said, hey, Paul's in a mess. Do you want to give? They pooled their money. Uh, but just like I'm having trouble getting the Bibles in Kenya, just doesn't like my credit card, and there's exchange rate, and there's all this kind of rot, so it's going to take some while. They had to get the money to Rome, but they didn't have a digital system to do it. They have to send somebody. So they send this guy named Epaphroditus. Uh, he's, the, uh, chapter 4 calls him the sent one. That's the same word in Greek used for apostle. Um, but he's, so apostles are sent ones from God. This is a sent one from the church in Philippi. He's a little more like a mailman, uh, and he goes. It reminded me reading through it of when um, we do a bunch of fundraisers for Haiti, because Haiti was on my mind for this missionary you know, contest. And when we show up, we always show up with money that we've raised here to help them do their summer camp. Um, so another kind of don't follow Jesus for statement would be, don't follow Jesus for money, follow Jesus for money, for Jesus. Just follow him for who he is. And we get in this American dream and we have this idea that, gosh, if I will do what God has told me to do, then the, the promise over here is going to be money and it's going to be the American dream and it's going to be health and it's going to be all this stuff. But he said, no, 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 no. That's not the promise. The promise is you'll shine. You'll be pure. You'll make God himself proud. There will be joy in heaven and there will be joy on earth. You'll be blameless even in the non-believing world. They'll say, gosh, you know, I don't believe in his God, and the person's a jerk, but you know what? He or she, gosh, they're blameless. I have nothing I can say against them. That's the promise. So we don't follow Jesus for money. But if we do follow him, then we get to know Jesus. That's the goal. That's what it's about. It's, it's about just the joy of knowing God. And then we get the church thrown in, and it's the church that comes around, the body of Christ, that really bails Paul out in this situation. I've got a, another slide, which is a map, and boy, this guy's got to go. He has about 350 miles to travel from Philippi to the Adriatic Sea. Then he takes a ship. Then he's got another 350 miles to go to Rome. These are dangerous times. He's traveling some 700 miles by foot. We figure at least you know a couple of months to get to Rome with a pile of money on him. So uh, there are those who think, and, and um, I'm inclined to think they're probably right, that he may used to have been part of the Praetorian Guard, of the elite guard of Caesar. Because there's even a coin that has a, the back of the coin talks about um, the guard and Philippi, because so many of the guard would retire in Philippi. It was just their place to go. And it was little Rome. So he's very likely, very possibly, a retired guard that's now living in Philippi. And they say, you know, we, we have some folks here who, train concealed carry and have guarded you know, presidents and past presidents, and it's like, yeah, I'm not messing with that dude. You know, so it's like saying, ah, oh, I know who I'm sending with the money to go. And, and I won't say the name because it's online, but yeah, we all know who it would be, right? Um, so he goes, and because of the money he brings there, because of his gift, Acts 28 verse 30 says, for two whole years, Paul's able to stay in the apartment there in his own rented house. He welcomes everyone who comes to see him. He proclaimed the kingdom of God, and he taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with boldness and without hindrance. So you can see now the gospel's expanding in Rome because uh, God allowed him to be a prisoner. And probably Epaphroditus expected to stay there indefinitely until Paul, until the sentence was handed down, whether it was freedom or death. But that doesn't happen. Uh, he gets a, a, a bad sickness, and, uh, and back then when you got sick, 
with a major sickness, it was likely you'd die, right? We didn't have the kind of medical help we do now. And so here's what Paul does, uh, chapter 2, verse 25. I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. He longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died. But God had mercy on me, and not him only, but also on me, to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him, so that when you see him again, you may be glad, and I may have less anxiety. So then, welcome him in the Lord with great joy, and honor people like him, because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. So we get a glimpse there of what working out our salvation, really following God, looks like. Uh, in verse 25, it says, he, you sent him to take care of my needs. That's a word that, that you can translate as minister to my needs, or minister as a priest. It's the same word that's used of Jesus in Hebrews 8 when, when it says that, he, that he's in the sanctuary in the temple of heaven to, to be our minister, our high priest. And so Epaphroditus, you, no one knows who he is. And I was thinking of, of, you know, walking around in heaven one day and go, you know, going up to someone, hey, you know, what, what, what's your name? And, and Epaphroditus, I said, yeah, man, I'm in the Bible. I said, who are you? I never, you know, I've heard of Ruth and Esther and Paul and Moses, but who are you? And, and, and uh, he'd be able to say, yeah, well, I was, I was Paul's pastor. You know, it's not, that's not bad because that's <laughs> who he was. He went there to minister to Paul. And we can be ministers, we can be pastors. It doesn't mean we're wiser than others. It just means we care for others. That's what it means. It means that, that we share the interests of Christ, and so we care for them. And, you know, when, when people are sick and, and, and uh, the, this church has been gathering around and bringing meals, uh, Karen and over here, when moms have their babies, we gather around and, and we bring meals. Uh, home team leaders have been checking in and ministering to the people in their, in their groups. Some of you have just said, man, I haven't heard from any in church in a while. I'm just going to reach out. I'm going to care for somebody else. That's pastoring them. The letter I got from Paul asking, just asking, Dan, how are you and Jolyn doing? How's the church doing? That ministers to me. It's uh, He's pastoring me when he does that. Um, and so I'm going to shift gears a little bit roughly here, uh, going into my really my last Don't Follow Christ 4. And this one is, don't follow Christ for your health. Follow Christ for Christ. And well, if we'll follow Christ for Christ, we'll get eternal life thrown in. You know, we'll get eternal health thrown in. But read through this passage and realize you can get sick and you can die for doing the will of God. There was no guarantee Epaphroditus was going to get better. Paul didn't have any magic pill miracle for him. He could have died for doing the will of God, but it would have been the best thing. And yet God said, no, I, you know, at this time I'm going to heal. This time I think healing is the best thing. But we don't follow Christ for our health. We don't follow Christ for our money. We don't follow Christ for the American dream. We don't follow Christ for a predictable life. We follow Jesus so we get to know Jesus because what he's asked us to do. And there is a promise we will shine you know, we, we will make him proud. There is joy, but we don't do it for the American dream. And then it says that uh, he risked his life. That's a form of a Greek word, uh, parabolana, and it's also a, a Latin word, very similar. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. But it, the, the meaning of the word, parabolana, is gamble. He risked his life. He gambled his life, or hazard, you could translate it, his life. In other words, I know that Paul needs the money. You've given it. It's got to go, you know, once you add the sea and everything in here, over 800 miles away. I'm going to be staying in inns. I'm going to be trying to find a place to stay on the side of the road. I got a bunch of money with me. This isn't, I'm going to gamble my life and bring it. And then, possibly because of the trip, his health goes to pot. It, it, but he was willing to do that because he had, he must have had this huge desire. I want to get that money to Paul. I'm going to see this done. You're saying it's too dangerous to get done. I'm getting it done, right? And through the power of God, 
he stopped whining, and he got it done. He was a pastor, and he was a gambler. It was dangerous. I love the way Paul calls him a brother, and then he calls him a, this co-worker, and then this co-soldier. You see how it, it kind of escalates there. Uh, Gandhi once said, a coward is incapable of exhibiting love. It's the prerogative of the brave. And this was a, a, a brave man who must have loved Paul and loved his Lord. And he exhibits it by doing this. You know, it's, it's such a picture of the gospel. Jesus loves you. And because he loves you so much, he gave his life for you so that if you'll trust in him, he will give you eternal life and he'll give you desires and he'll give you a new life. We need to, finally he says in there, to honor him. Honor people like him. I believe we need to honor the gamblers. And I understand there's a, there's a place where we can be stupid in this, where we can just do things that aren't wise. But when we are doing what God's desire, what he's really told us to do, then we are in his hands, and I believe we should honor that. Uh, there was a time, and again, I think it, I can't remember which missionaries, it may have been the one from Haiti, when they came uh, into the old church in the school, and we had prompted everybody so that when they walk in from the back of the church to the front to give their report, everybody stood and applauded and just cheered them on. And can you imagine how that made them feel? But I, I, I'm going to tell you it's a gamble to live in Port-au-Prince. It was a gamble to stay there through COVID. There's no social. How do you social distance in a third world country? I, you can call them developing countries, but it's not developing. I, it, there's no social distancing. There's no, I mean, you're not going to be hand sanitizing. It just, it just goes through. And, well, and not to mention the gamble of them selling everything to go there in the first place. Yeah, they sold their, entire, their, their farm. and Talk about going against the interests of the modern day mindset. Yeah. And it was totally out of love. You know, they adopted some kids from there and said, no, God's calling them. They were farmers, not missionaries. Partly as a result of this guy, the early church had a group that they called the gamblers. Uh, they called them the parable lammies, the, ga the gamblers, the riskers. They acted as clergy in the very early church. They nursed the sick and they buried the dead. Um, they would even do honorable burials for their enemies. And others ran from the dead, especially during plagues. They, they understood somehow that sickness could come from them, but these people were willing to be there. They were, they so worked with the down and outers that they were forbidden at public gatherings and theaters. Kind of like now, where it's okay. What you were around that person? Okay, you you know you need to quarantine for two weeks, right? You came from Texas. We're putting you in a hole for two weeks. That these people, no, you're not gonna you're not gonna hang around anybody else. We don't trust you. In the plague of 252. That plague lasted 20 years, and we're not sure what it was, but we know it caused diarrhea, vomiting, fever, deafness, blindness, paralysis, and blood-filled eyes. Most of the people, of course, who got it died. And yet, the Parabolani in the early church went through that 20 years caring for those people, and it was a gamble. Not a gamble in that, am I, am I walking with God, but a gamble and what's going to happen to me? They just didn't know. But they had this desire to care for folks throughout the plague. As a result of their actions, the church spread throughout the empire. You know, Revelation 20 talks about people before the throne of God who get special honor, people who were martyred for the cause. I believe all of those who died in that plague, all the Parabolani, will get special honor in heaven because they were martyred for the cause of Christ. They put his interests above their own. And can you imagine being in glory when millions of believers stand up and, and, and give them honor when they walk down? It's something greater than the American dream. We don't follow Jesus so that we have some predictable life with extra money and health. We follow Jesus for Jesus. He's the one we want to know. He's the one we want to honor uh, he's the one we want to give joy, and he's the one we want to make proud. See, the, 
the gospel is that God loves you. And he sent his only son to die on the cross for you because you and I are selfish and we just want things for, you know, we want things for ourselves. We want things our own way. And as a result of that, we've sinned and we've, we've been distanced from God. We're separated from him. So he sent his son to close that distance, to put our sin away, to take our sin for us and just wash it away and give us a totally new life in him. He loves us, period. He was willing to do that. The question is, will we follow him and love others? Will we have a bit, take a bit of that love forward? Isaac Watts said it so well in his, uh, his old song, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. You may remember these words. Were the whole realm of nature mine, that'd be a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, it demands my soul, my life, my all. And then Paul ends this whole section Here's how, here's how Timothy did it. Here's how he worked out his salvation. And here's how Epaphroditus did it. Here's how he worked his salvation. Look how they shine. Look how they made God proud. Look at their joy. And then, you know, in the whole context that I'm a prisoner, Nero may take off my head, he says, chapter 3, verse 1, further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. You know, how cool is that? He says, yeah, I don't rejoice in the Lord because... It's not because I'm rich or because, I, or because I'm healthy. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm chained to this guard here. But look what God's doing. He's winning guards to Jesus. He's giving me joy. He's giving me Timothy. He's giving me Epaphroditus. I am so happy in the Lord. And that's my prayer for you and my prayer for me that we would take a bit of this, that putting the goals and interests of Jesus above our own really, really would define the church called into play. You pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you for these examples. Look forward to meeting these guys. Um, and uh, we ask for the conviction of your spirit in our hearts that we would follow you first and foremost, that we would put your goals and interests above our own. We've got a bunch of our own, Father. And uh, not sin to have interests, but we just want to make sure yours are first, that we follow you above all. We want to shine in this world. In your name and for your glory we pray, amen. Thank you so much for joining us.